Okay. So yeah, we have about 450 people signed up. Not everyone can be here um, this morning. I'm glad you're here live or watching um, the video. And, um, and so hopefully you've started to dig through some of the materials. We had a getting ready week with uh, some videos and readings. And then we had our first week of materials that was posted. Um, and then on uh, by Monday of the week, I'll post that week's materials. So there'll always be readings, uh, probably a short videos, uh, scientific paper, um, some, some neat things to explore and, and learn about. So the format of today's webinar is a little different than our typical webinars, which will start next week with Ashley Kohanek. Um, with that webinar, Ashley will do a shorter talk. We'll have time for questions. And then I have uh, folks who will be giving some input, talking about what's happening in different places across the state. Um, some people highlighting what phenology means to them. Uh, Bob Heath is going to do Dr. Bob's history short, so he's going to talk about phenology uh, through history, and we'll have some time to do some small group work. So this week is a little different. I wanted to give us all a foundation in phenology. I know a lot of you have been in programs with me in the past, and so this may be review. I've tried to add some new material and some new slides in to hopefully keep it interesting, even if you feel like you've seen me teach phenology over and over. Um, so if we haven't met before, I'm uh, with the Department of Entomology, uh, based out of Worcester, usually now based out of my Zoom room um, here in Stark County in Maslin. And my main focus is pollinator education outreach for the department. So we may have met with uh, some OCBN programs or Master Gardener programs. I run the volunteer uh, pollinator specialist program. So we may have uh, run into each other at different points across, uh, across the state. But before I came to entomology, I was a county extension educator in the Stark and Summit County's office. So shout out to all you Stark Summit folks who are joining us. I was the horticulture natural resources educator for um, about 18 years there and had worked with Dan Herms on phenology in my role in the county. So when I moved over to the Department of Entomology, I was able to bring uh, my phenology passion with me and uh, open that to kind of a different audience. So last year when COVID hit, all of our in-person programs, of course, went online. And so we had a really nice turnout for a pollinator class um, on the Moodle format online. We did a lot of phenology sharing and it got me excited about having folks really come together and focus on phenology, improving our observation skills, and really think about um, how that natural sequence of events can, can make us better gardeners, better naturalists, uh, better observers. So that's what brings us all. Yes. Before we go on, uh, yes. one of our participants says that she cannot hear anything. So it must be on, on her end. So um, okay. if it's, yeah, if it's not the mute button, um, she might try to just hop off and come back in. Um, but another option, folks, is that you can um, call in, right? So if you're watching on your computer, but your audio goes out in your invitation, there are phone numbers. So you can call in. It's kind of awkward, but you can be on your phone to hear, right? You can put it on speaker. Um, and then you'll be able to see on your computer. So yeah, thanks, Sarah. Okay. Uh, so let's um, let's jump in. We're going to talk about phenology, uh, what it means, what we, uh, how we can use it, how our calendar was developed, and um, and so this is usually one of the questions that we have, right? Uh, is it spring? This is one way that I know. And for me, it was uh, February 26th this year. I'm in Stark County, which is two counties south of Cleveland. And um, I saw my first uh, turkey vulture coming back. I live really close to the Tuscarawas River, and um, there's a nice place that the turkey vultures like to roost down by the river. So I started to see those, um, those turkey vultures. So one way that I know spring is coming, and that was your um, journal prompt, if you're doing a journal for this, this study group, um, your journal prompt was, uh, you know, how do you know that spring is on its way? Here's another way you might know the call of the red-winged blackbird as he um, sets up his territory, right? And so when I was in the county, we always did a um, Saturday gardening series on Saturdays in March, right? It's frozen. Gardeners are itching to do something, but it's not uh, time to, to, you know, really do anything outside. So we'd come together at a church and have lots of great speakers. And so the first Saturday we'd get together, it was right across from a little wetland area. Um, there's nothing happening. The wetland is frozen. There's no uh, activity. 
the second Saturday, you know, we may see the pussy willow buds swell just a little in the that wetland, or maybe the maple twigs are starting to redden. Um, but always by that third Saturday in March, we would hear the red winged blackbirds. Um, and then we knew that, you know, spring was really on its way. And I knew that if I went to uh, Quail Hollow Park, which is in Hartville in Stark County, I would probably see this flower in bloom. That's skunk cabbage, probably our uh, very earliest native wildflower um, that we see across the state. And you can see in the background here, the, um, the wetland is frozen, but the metabolism of, of the skunk cabbage, it's able to, to melt its way um, out, of, out of snow and ice. So these two events, the call of the red-winged blackbird and the blooming of skunk cabbage are two events that I noticed seem to occur at the same time every year. And that's really the essence of phenology. It's that timing, that synchrony of different biological events. So I grew up in Western Pennsylvania in the Laurel Highlands, um, not, too not too far from Falling Water, if you know where that Frank Lord Wright home is, or Seven Springs. Uh, I grew up on the top of a, a rounded off old mountaintop that um, used to be a ski slope, but it was a baby ski slope and had gone back to succession. So I would watch the, um, the, the wildflowers bloom and um, the small trees, and now it's all forested uh, again. But the way I, <clears throat> excuse me, the way I knew on the mountain that um, spring was coming is uh, this plant, which is probably our earliest non-native wildflower, right? So this is colt's foot, um, resembles dandelion, but it has the, um, the ray flowers on the outside and the disc flowers on uh, the interior. And so, right, we're looking at like dozens and dozens of flowers when we look at this one, um, one yellow disc. And so on our gravel road in the mountains, when Colt's foot would pop up, I knew that um, you know, spring was finally working its way up the mountain. And we can see here uh, a honeybee visiting this Colt's foot. And when we talk in, in one of our later sessions about bee phenology, we'll come back to honeybees, which are a little bit different than our native wild bees because honeybees can regulate their temperature in the hive. So they actually are pretty active all throughout the season as long as it's 55 degrees. It's a little different than, um, than other bees and we'll, we'll come back to that later. So this science of phenology, um, it's not phrenology, uh, which is the uh, pseudoscience that says that the bumps on your head tell about your character, whether you're trustworthy or murderous or uh, deceitful. And uh, so a, a pseudoscience, and this is a piece of a, um, a, a uh, magazine ad from years ago that shows you how you can tell a genuine husband from an unreliable husband. Um, so, of course, the unreliable husband, uh, big on bigamy and polygamy. Um, so, you know, the idea was we're looking for that phrenology, that um, shape of the head. Of course, a lot of um, uh, racism probably going with uh, phrenology. So we're learning about phenology, which is the study of what shows or appears. Um, so it's the study of these cyclic events, the sequence of biological events, and how they relate to climate and to weather. So climate, um, think about climate like you think about your wardrobe, right? So in your closet, you have all different kinds of clothes. Um, so climate is like your, your wardrobe and weather is like what you wear on a particular day. Right, so your, your climate is different if you're in Florida versus whether you're in Ohio or in Maine, um, and then the weather fluctuates within that. So in phenology, we're looking at both climate and, um, and, and weather and how those two um, phenomena interact with biological events. So there are a lot of different ways that we can think about phenology, and I try to use some of these different methods to connect with folks if, if they're new to the world of phenology. Um, you know, we all have kind of our wardrobe phenology, our natural sequence of, of clothing that we bring out, right? We're probably just putting away those winter coats right now. I still have a pair of uh, snow boots out just in case. Sorry if I jinxed us. Um, but, you know, then we're switching out to, um, to different clothes throughout the season. Uh, we can think about, uh, and the top left is uh, a Walmart display of holiday decorations, right? And there is a natural sequence or a, a you know, cultural sequence of, of, 
holidays that we celebrate and we can we know we can predict what holiday is coming next um, based on those decorations out at Walmart. Um, sports have a phenology, right? There are seasons with sports, and that is often a matter of, of whether the, that sport can be played indoor or outdoor. So we have this natural progression, cultural progression. Uh, our foods reflect phenology typically. I mean, we have a lot of mass um, um, transportation for our food, so it's a little more generic. We can get foods from uh, across the globe, but there are still seasons in, um, in that food um, selection, and we can watch that, especially if we're shopping somewhere local. Uh, we have a local farmers cooperative in Worcester called Local Roots, which uh, if you ever come to Worcester, you need to go to Local Roots. And you can really see that phenology there. Right now they have um, you know, some of those winter greens, they have some potatoes and onions, and then are starting to look at those um, early spring crops. They'll have arugula before long and some early radishes. So there's that natural progression of, of our edible um, um, food crops. Of course, if you're into uh, biology, you, maybe you follow um, a waterfowl phenology. I love to go down to Shreve and uh, my husband and I were there a couple weeks ago looking at the buffalo heads and um, the other uh, migrating waterfowl that were there on the wetlands. And there is a, a natural sequence, right, of, of when, but also which species we tend to see as they move through to their breeding grounds. Uh, wildflower phenology, I mentioned the skunk cabbage. Uh, many of you have posted already images of uh, spring beauties or of bloodroot or Dutchman's breeches and, uh, and, and our, our trees that are starting to bloom. So we can definitely look at that natural sequence of uh, bloom events through the season. Uh, my husband notices uh, the dog shed phenology, right? So when uh, we have a golden retriever in a, um, in a lab mix, and so they have different shed patterns, but um, you know, we start to see shedding happen before it's even warmed up for the spring, but we know um, spring is coming because there's hair on the hardwood floor. So there are a lot of different ways to think about phenology and use phenology. If you get allergies, um, you probably know about, um, um, you know, different plants in bloom, you can kind of track the seasons by uh, your allergies as well. So hopefully you uh, had a chance to watch Dr. Stan Temple's uh, wonderful webinar with the Aldo Leopold Foundation. Um, it was live a couple weeks ago. It's on our website under Getting Started. So if you hadn't had a chance to review that webinar, I definitely recommend that you go back and, uh, and watch that. And so Dr. Temple, a longtime faculty member in Wisconsin, um, and now with the Aldo Leopold Foundation, are really looking at that science of phenology. What is the history of phenology? Um, how does phenology rate to, um, um, uh, sorry, how does it um, influence climate change? Um, and how can we look at different species? For example, he talked about migrating birds, short distance and long distance migration, um, and how those are influenced by, um, by climate and some of the impacts that we may see as, uh, as our climate changes. So there's a rich history with uh, humans and phenology. Um, and we, to survive as humans living in groups, we needed to know the natural cues, what's happening around us, um, and how can that inform what plants are ready to harvest or what migrating uh, animals might be coming through. Uh, when are those berries ripe? When are the, um, the tubers ready to dig? When do we move, need to move to that next location? Um, and our lives really depend on that when we're um, hunter-gatherers. And we pass that along through oral traditions um, before we had written the written word. And then when we switch to, or when we uh, human societies evolved into um, agricultural societies, again, we had to use those natural um, signals around us to know when is it time to till? When is it time um, to plant our seed? We didn't have a lot of seed and it was very valuable. Um, we don't wanna put it in too early as the, you know, may freeze and rot. Uh, and we don't wanna put it in too late or we may not be able to harvest um, to, to keep us through the winter. So we definitely started to, um, to, to work more on those written notes, observations, um, and folklore that we passed on from generation to generation um, that have to do with phenology. So on this slide, you can see a little uh, oak leaf, and I put that up there because um, pro probably lots of you know that bit of folklore about oak leaves and, um, and what you plant when the oak leaves are as big as what? As big as a squirrel's ear. 
right? So the, the, um, the, the tale is that you should plant corn when oak leaves are as big as a squirrel's ear. I don't know how big your squirrel's ear are and how you decide that, but um, so that's one of the, um, the oral traditions that's been passed around uh, for generations. So we, we can go to the calendar and often with as gardeners or as naturalists, we're looking to our human calendar um, our, and, and looking at you know, what, what is the date of the month and what should we be doing outside? And so there are definitely, definitely some places where the human calendar diverges from mother nature's calendar. And one of the most uh, notable examples of that is what we say we're supposed to do on St. Patrick's Day. So on St. Patrick's Day, and if you're on Facebook, there are probably you know, uh, uh, memes or postings about this that you're supposed to plant your peas or maybe your potatoes on um, St. Patrick's Day. And maybe you did, some of you might have, have um, gone out as a tradition and, and put those seeds in the ground. Uh, but that, uh, that bit of advice is carried on whether you live in Ohio or you live in Florida or you live in California, in all of those places, it's recommended that you plant uh, peas on St. Patrick's Day. And we know that Ohio is very, very different from Florida. My brother lives in Cocoa Beach, um, a very different um, uh, St. Patrick's Day for him than for me here in Stark County. And so those, those human calendars, those dates aren't very reliable. And you know we can go to Puxatani Phil, who comes out on Grand Groundhog's Day, um, and is said to predict what is happening with the weather. And actually, it's a, a coin toss as how uh, how reliable um, that calendar association turns out to be. So there are a lot of these different folklore elements, and I'm going to invite all of you in. Um, a few minutes, I'll talk about an Instagram hashtag that we have, and I'd love to have you share some of those uh, those folklore sayings that you know, maybe that you get from the uh, farmer's almanac um, or ones that you use in your own garden to help to help guide your um, guide your planting or your harvesting. So in uh, in the old days, well, in the old days, OSU Extension was called the Ohio Cooperative Extension Service. I always thought it was interesting that we took service out, but we still try to serve. But it, so in the old days, if you look at old fact sheets, our recommendations were based on those calendar dates. And since most of our specialists were based out of Columbus and, and still are, uh, our, our recommendations, for example, when do you spray for uh, tent caterpillars? And so the recommendation might be you spray on this date in Columbus, uh, minus 10 days if you're in Cincinnati and um, two, 10 days later if you're in Cleveland. So they were all very calendar based and they would just print those fact sheets out every year, hand those out. And you know, our weather fluctuates so much from year to year. Um, if I'm in a group in, in person and we have a, a small enough group or if I'm with a youth group teaching about phonology, uh, something I like to do is um, the phonology of birthdays. And so I have everyone stand up uh, and first they think of something that's associated with a natural event that's associated with their birthday. So my birthday's in late December. I might think of, you know, the first really heavy snow or the ice just starting to form at the, you know, at the edges of the river. Uh, and maybe your birthday's in, in May, you might think of lilacs blooming or October and you're thinking of pumpkins harvesting. Um, and so without saying the date, the calendar date of our birthday, we use those natural events to line ourselves up in a circle to, um, to put ourselves in order of our birthday, right? So the lilac goes before the pumpkin that goes before the ice on the pond. And then we all say our natural events and then we say our birthday and see how close we got. And, and it's really cool to, to kind of see that progression in, with people in a, in a living space. So those calendar dates change, uh, the events that happen on those calendar dates change from year to year. So the lilacs may bloom on your birthday one year, but not uh, the next year, it's a little colder, it's a little warmer. Um, and so we have, we have issues with those calendar dates. So this, uh, this phonology calendar was developed by Dr. Dan Herms. We're going to talk about this calendar, uh, what Dan did to develop it, some different ways that it's being used and, and ways that it can help um, inform you as a, an observer, as a naturalist, as a gardener. And you've probably already been on there, but um, so there's a little um, 
cheat up there, GDD and OSU is one of the easiest ways to get there. It should be the first choice in your Google bar, your search bar. And if you haven't done that already, you could uh, hop on your phone and put that in, uh, put in your zip code any, anywhere in the state and, uh, and it will dump you into the calendar and we'll walk through um, how the calendar was developed and how you can use it. Um, but let's, let's talk about Dr. Dan Herms first and Dan will be with us in May coming together to talk about his work with phonology now as the vice president of research at Davy Tree. And so Dan, when Dan was in Michigan, he worked at Dow Gardens as he worked on his, um, his graduate work. And he was the head of integrated pest management for Dow Gardens in Midland, Michigan, which maybe you've been there. It's a really beautiful public garden. So as the integrated pest management specialist, Dan would walk around uh, starting in very early spring, right now, right? And he would start to make a list of what he's seeing. What's just coming into bloom? Uh, what insects are emerging? What eggs of insects are hatching? And what's in bloom now? Uh, what's in full bloom? What's, in, in, uh, what's just coming into first bloom? And so imagine a yellow legal pad and he's just writing this long list of what he sees today, uh, maybe waits two days and what he sees um, then and, and just continually all, the, all through the season. So he's got this long list. What I like to think of is this long scroll of events, uh, mostly woody ornamentals, so trees and shrubs, and um, mostly insects of ornamental plants. So pests of ornamental plants, because that's what his interest was. He was supposed to you know, come up with management plans for these insects there at Dow Gardens. So starting with the first bloom of silver maple, um, writing down all of these plants and in insect uh, development stages, you can turn the page, turn the page, this long scroll all the way through to Rose of Sharon in bloom. So Dan did that for about five years in Michigan, and then he came on as a faculty member with the Department of Entomology at OSU, based out of Worcester. And so he kept doing that, uh, that research at Secret Arboretum, walking through, you know, many of the same plants were grown in Michigan as in Ohio. So he could kind of modify that long scroll, add plants in that were in, in um, the gardens at Seacrest, add insects that were of interest to him or that were prevalent there at Seacrest and created this long, long scroll. So, um, so why was he looking at plants and insects? Well, the key premise of this calendar is that the development rate of plants and insects both depend on temperature. And so we know this just by experience. If it's a warm, you know, we've had a warm couple of days. I had 80 degree temperatures for, at my home for the last two days. And so development progresses much more quickly for plants and insects when temperatures are warm. This is totally different than mammals or birds, right? They're in their development. Is, so they're um, the development of the hatchling into the adult bird or the, um, the pregnancy in the, the adult squirrel is not pushed ahead by warm temperatures, right? We're regulated internally. We're not externally dependent on those temperatures to push our development like plants and insects are. And so this whole, um, this whole premise is really designed the whole calendar. And so we can use plants to track insects. Uh, we can use insects, insect events to give us a, a clue for what is coming next into bloom. Uh, and we're gonna talk about growing degree days and how that relates to, um, to this idea of phenology. But the real key that I want you to take away is that this sequence of events, the sequence of the scroll that Dan created is the same every year. And that's really the power of this calendar and the power of, of phonology. So let's look at the calendar. Um, you can put, uh, it'll default out to, it should anyway, default out to today's date, um, but you can put past dates in as well. If you're curious what happened you know, two years ago or on your birthday or some event in the past, this uses all of the weather data that OARDC has been has, has gathered. So even before the calendar was developed, you can put those past dates in and it'll drop you in and tell you what should have been in bloom on that date. So here I was uh, yesterday, 44646, that's me in Massillon, and it drops me in, um, when I put this into that first screen, it drops me in then to this box. 
And everything on the left of this box is what's already happening for me in Maslin. And what's to the right of that box is what is yet to happen. Okay, and so Allegheny service berries should be in first bloom, star magnolia in full bloom, Sergeant cherry in full bloom. And just coming into Manchu cherries, uh, spring snow crab apple first bloom and so on. Okay, and so now if I click on view full calendar, it drops me into that long scroll that Dan developed. Okay, so here this black bar shows me where I am right now. Here I am at Maslin, 155 growing degree day units. That's a measure of accumulated heat. And we'll talk more about that. What's above the black bar is what's already happened, right? So Norway maple uh, was in full bloom at about 149 growing degree days. Um, calorie pears in full bloom, Allegheny service berry in first bloom. Everything below the black bar is what's about to happen. We don't know how quickly we'll get to those future events, right? We can't even predict, uh, you know, weather very accurately. So we don't know if it'll be cold tomorrow. Everything really slows down. If it's another warm day, we'll progress pretty quickly through those future events. But we don't have a way to predict when we will get to, for example, uh, PJM rhododendron in full bloom or another event that's much further down the calendar. We know it's in the future, but we don't know, uh, you know how the temperatures will develop um, that'll get us there. But the sequence will always be the same. And that's why when I teach about phenology, I always suggest that people, especially if you're new to the calendar and new to phenology, check into the calendar a couple times a week. This is the perfect time to learn about phenology. So as spring is unfolding, just check into the calendar, put your zip code in and see where it's dropping you um, you know, where are you in that scroll? And then do some ground truthing. Is this true? Is this, you know, am I seeing already calorie pairs in full bloom? Maybe I'm a little further ahead than the calendar says I am based on the weather station. Uh, and um, you may be in a, in a little warm place. Maybe you're a little bit more of an urban area. So it'll be a little heat island. Or maybe you're down in a valley and it's a little more slow to progress. Right, so, um, so you do need to kind of ground truth, but again, the, the sequence is the same. So even if you're down further here, my PJM rhododendrons in full bloom, I can still see what's about to happen. All right, so if you're like me, it's really easy to forget from year to year what the weather was like last year. And so there's a tool to be able to do that. So if we click on summary, um, so here I was, um, you know, on the 8th of April, 155 growing degree day units. I click on summary and it tells me on this calendar date for the last six years, how many growing degree day units had accumulated. So then I can kind of compare, well, you know, we're a little bit further ahead of last year and last year seemed a little uh, on the warm side. We're behind 2019, we're pretty far behind 2018, we only had 67 growing degree day units that had accumulated, right? So it just gives you an idea uh, of what the, uh, how many growing degree day units had accumulated in the past. So a little bit about how those growing degree day units are calculated. Actually, let me go back and just talk about it for a second. So today I have 155 growing degree day units. You might have 187, you might have 120. Um, what does that mean? So in January, we zero out those growing degree day units and we don't accumulate those heat units, right? So it doesn't mean a number of days. This doesn't mean 155 warm days or 155 days since January. It's a measure of accumulated heat. And it's that heat that accumulates in a 24 hour period. So that's, that's the day part. So if you're kind of stuck on, I don't get it. Why is it called growing degree days? It's the amount of heat that accumulates in one 24 hour period. So how do we, how do we tally those, uh, those numbers, those units? Um, the nice part is because of our calendar, you never have to, unless you want to, figure out how many growing degree days you have right now in, in your zip code, because the calendar does that for you. But I think it's helpful to know how those growing degree day units are calculated. So it makes a little more sense when somebody says, well, I have you know, 87 growing degree days, what does that mean? So we have weather stations, um, thanks to the USDA and others across the state of Ohio. And those weather stations are sending that weather data to a central computer in, um, in Worcester. 
and um, among other things, soil temperature and um, air temperature, wind speed, uh, we use the temperature, the average daily temperature to calculate growing degree day units. So back up, think about that. We already said that development of insects and plants is determined by temperature. So the warmer the temperature, the faster the development. So we use the average daily temperature to um, figure out how much heat, how many heat units accumulated in that 24 hour period. So we zero out in January. Our base temperature is um, 50. And so different studies and different systems use different base temperatures. So if you're comparing somebody else, another state's growing degree day model, you need to know what their base temperature is. So a 50 degree base means that for every day that it's above 50 degrees average daily temperature, we're accumulating heat units, we're accumulating degree day units. And if the temperature is below 50 degrees, we're just making this human assumption, this scientific assumption that development is not happening, okay? We know that that's flawed. If it's if we haven't come to an average daily temperature of 50 degrees, we can still have skunk cabbage, you know, emer emerging through that wetland. Um, biological events are still happening, but because our calendar has 150 diff some different plants and um, you know all these uh, over um, uh, over 50 different insect species, we can't know the exact temperature for all of those. Um, organisms and above which temperature their development occurs. So we just say, we're calling it 50. And for every day that the average daily temperature is above 50, we're gonna accumulate some of those heat units, okay? We're almost done with the math, just hang on there with me. If you're really into math on our, uh, um, on our calendar, it goes into the, um, the way that these numbers are calculated. I'm gonna talk about the simple method to calculate growing degree days but we actually use the modified sign method. Um, and if you're into math, that's turning you on and you can go and learn more about that. But I'm just gonna talk about the, the simple way to calculate degree days. So in this example, we're saying that there have been no warm days, no days averaging 50 degrees or above um, between January 1 and March 6th. So on March 6th, we had a high of 60 and a low of 56. Okay, and, um, and so our base temperature is uh, 50. So we add our high temperature and our low temperature, and we divide by two to get the average, and we say that at the end of the day on March 6th, we accumulated eight degree day units. Okay, so in one day, we accumulated eight units. So that you know clarifies it wasn't eight days from January, it wasn't eight 24 hour periods, it was eight heat units. And then the next day, March 7th, we had a high of 70 and a low of 40. Again, we want the average daily temperature, but we don't use any temperature in our calculation that's below our base. So we don't use 40, um, we use 50 because development doesn't go backwards, right? That skunk cabbage doesn't go back into the ground if it's cold. Um, those pussy willow buds don't uh, stop turning color. They don't push back into the branch everything just kind of holds still until warm temperatures continue and the development continues. So we don't use any temperatures in our calculation that are lower than our base, which is 50. So we use our high plus our, no, we don't use 40, we use 50 as our base to get our average daily temperature of 60. Uh, we subtract our base, I forgot to say that over here, we subtract the base uh, and that gives us 10 degree day units for March 6th, sorry, for March 7th. We add our eight units from yesterday. And now at the end of March 6th, we have 18 degree day units that have accumulated. If March 8th and 9th and 10th and all the way to the end of the month, we have no days with the average daily temperature above 50. And we stay at 18 degree days until we finally get a warmer day, right? So these temperature, these um, heat units are very slow to develop in late winter and early spring. It just seems like things are creeping along um, until we get some really warm days. Okay. So here's an example. Oh, wait, we've had some very warm days. So um, this is from the, the 7th of April. We had a high of 57 um, near me and uh, sorry, a low of 57 and a high of 83. So if we take that average daily temperature, we subtract our base. And on just one day, we had 20 heat units that accumulated. 
Okay, so as we get into warmer nights and warmer days, those degree day units really start to accumulate quickly. So now we, you know, we went from 168 growing degree day units um, to 188 units. Um, and so those, those, those tallies just go much faster as we have warmer nights and warmer days. So let's go back to the calendar. Here's the top of the screen uh, of, the, of the scroll. And so here's a date I just put in January 1st. This was 2016, then I took the screenshot. And so we have zero growing degree days that have accumulated. Um, and then these are the events that we track on the calendar. So starting with silver maple in first bloom, and then cornu and cherry dogwood in first bloom, silver maple in full bloom. And I'll talk about those, those phenophase definitions of those stages that we're looking for. Um, it's hard to tell with my screenshot, but our insect events are in bold. And, um, and so for the, pipe, for the white pine weevil, the adults emerge around 84 growing degree day units. Those are average based on, on data collection by Dan Herms. And so it's not like it's exactly at 80, 84, um, but it's kind of a range and that's the average uh, um, emergence uh, calculation. And so, you know, just a really quick example, if I wanted to know when white pine weevil adults were emerging, that's the pest that lays, she lays her eggs in the leader of your pine tree or your spruce tree. And as those beetle larvae hatch out, they start to eat the tissue underneath the bark. And pretty soon by early summer, that tissue has flagged on your leader. It's starting to turn color. Eventually it browns and now you've lost the leader on your pine or your spruce. So if I just know this timing, I know that the white pine weevil adult emerges around the time that star magnolias come into first bloom. So that can be my indicator. Let's say I have a Christmas tree farm. I know that if I'm using a pesticide to protect that leader, right, something that repels that beetle, it needs to get on before star magnolias are in first bloom. And my star magnolia can be my, um, my appointment maker, right? Oh, it's starting to swell, the bud's starting to swell. I better get out there and, and use that protective um, uh, management strategy, right? But I don't have to have the star magnolia near me because I have the calendar. So I can also be checking into the calendar to see what's happening um, on, on my dates. Okay, so here's an example of I, um, in the old days, well, um, before last year, right, I used to travel a lot to teach, and phenology is something that I, I teach a lot of. So this is a day a couple years ago that I had to travel from my home in Maslin down to Glendale near Cincinnati for a program. So I went to the calendar, we, I was teaching about phenology, and um, so I put the calendar, uh, put the, the zip code in, and so for me in Maslin, I was at 352 growing degree day units. Um, here we are, um, you know, everything that's already happened should be above me and what's yet to happen below me. So we we're about a bloom of a red chokeberry, if you know that plant, um, was in bloom in my yard. And when I put the Glendale zip code in, they were at 560 growing degree day units, right? I was at 352 in Maslin. Um, they were um, 560 in Glendale. So they were already at um, just coming into first bloom for mountain laurel, you know, much more like an early summer event um, as we think about it. And we know this as we look across the state, you know, as you travel um, from Ashtabula down to Cincinnati, you know, you're kind of traveling through these different uh, uh, biological zones where uh, what's happening in Cincinnati kind of works its way up, maybe 10 days to Columbus, maybe another 10 days to, to Cleveland. And depending on the weather fronts, especially with the lake, um, Ashtabula can be very, very cold when lots of, of plant events are happening in Cincinnati. Or if you travel to, you know, if you take spring break in, in um, southern states, you know as you drive that the spring is kind of unfolding as you drive south. Um, you turn around and come back to Ohio, it's still gray and frozen in Ohio when there are, you know, there may be uh, magnolias in bloom, there may be uh, rhododendrons in bloom uh, as, you, uh, as you drove south. So since plant development is temperature dependent, these phenological events, these first bloom or, or um, full bloom, these phenological events of plants can also be used to track degree days. 
and create a biological calendar to predict pest activity, to schedule pest management appointments. So the, the pest management appointments was why the calendar was developed, but it's so much bigger than this. Right. You can use this biological calendar to predict what's coming into bloom, um, to design a garden, to predict what uh, what bees you may begin to see in your landscape, to think about bird migration and how that's associated with plant phenology. Um, so there are so many ways to use um, to use this calendar. Uh, so this is a way that we added an insect event to the calendar a few years ago. So the viburnum leaf beetle is all these little kind of yellowish uh, beetle larvae on the back of this viburnum uh, are viburnum leaf beetle larvae. This was a, a new pest to Ohio in 2006. So we knew it was going to make its way across the state. I think it's actually down into Columbus by now. Uh, but we didn't know uh, how quickly it was going to move through or uh, when those eggs hatched out. So it overwinters as eggs laid in these uh, stems, these new growth, this new growth from last year. The female beetle digs a pit. Um, she actually poops in it, um, chews up the sawdust, lays her eggs, covers that up. And so I guess it's not very palatable to birds. And that's how they spend the winter. The, the adults die. And then sometime in the spring, these eggs hatch out, they uh, crawl down onto leaves and they can completely defoliate viburnum shrubs. The beetles then drop down into the ground, they pupate, they emerge as adults and they can, if the plant tried to push out new buds, the adults can come back and um, completely defoliate the shrub again. So we wanted to, to be able to advise people, what's the timing on this? When should we be scouting for these larvae? If we're going to prune off these uh, tips that have the eggs laid in them. Um, what's our timing? When do we need to do that? If we, if we come in too late, the eggs have already hatched, um, that's a management strategy we can't use. And so we took, Dan, Dan and I, Dan Herms and I took some of these tips that we knew had the beetles in them. Uh, we put them in um, nylon netting so they didn't uh, escape, right? This was new pests. We didn't want it in Worcester or in Maslin. And then we watched these beetles and waited for them to hatch out. And when they hatched out, it's, you know, you're kind of like an expectant parent waiting for something to happen. Um, and we noticed that uh, we knew the calculation of growing degree days because we could go to the calendar. And we also wanted to have a, a plant indicator so that we could tell people, look for uh, viburnum leaf beetle eggs to hatch around the time of what? Well, around the time that Korean spice viburnum, this viburnum in this picture, um, are just coming into bloom, or sorry, coming into full bloom. And so we could have used snowdrift crab apple coming into first bloom as our indicator, um, but I really like the idea of saying, scout for this viburnum pest when this common um, viburnum, ornamental viburnum is coming uh, into full bloom. Okay, so you don't have to go to the calendar, or you can, to kind of get a feel for when that's going to happen, but this is our natural predictor of, of these two events and how they're, um, they're synchronous. So we've been able to add different events to the calendar, unfortunately, um, you know, as new uh, uh, invasive pests have come into Ohio, we've tried to add those into the calendar, the emerald ash borer adults uh, and others. So how can I use this? Well, I can, I can be checking into the calendar uh, when I'm, you know, I'm kind of watching what's blooming, I'm checking into the calendar and I can see, this was me back in 2019, saying, okay, I'm, I'm, it's coming up, the viburnum leaf beetle is coming up the egg hatch, it's not here yet, um, but I can see that it's still yet to come. So it's time to get ready for, and as we saw, one warm day can push us from, um, you know, from here at 201 growing degree day units to 210. So that can happen really quickly. So let's talk about those definitions. What do I mean when I say first bloom and full bloom? Um, so our definition of first bloom is when the first flower in a cluster, so in this viburnum uh, cluster, or the first flower on a plant. So think of a star magnolia on the whole tree. So it's when that first flower opens to expose the sexual parts. That's our definition of first bloom. 
Our definition of full bloom is when one out of 20 flower buds is still closed. So whether that's in a cluster or on, um, you know, on a tree like the star magnolia, when one of those buds is still closed, that's our definition for full bloom. And the reason we use that definition instead of all the buds are open is that, that all the buds can be open today, tomorrow, the next day, um, but only one out of 20 buds closed, that's probably, it's, that's ephemeral. That's only gonna be today. They're probably gonna all open tomorrow, right? So it's an easier way to pinpoint that time in, in space, that activity. So one bud out of 20 still closed is our definition of full bloom. So that's important for you as you're taking notes and trying to make maybe your own phenological sequence, your own um, journal to, to capture phenology using consistent definitions. So, you know, what is your definition of full bloom? Um, hopefully you're using a similar definition if you're trying to compare events to, uh, to the calendar. So let's talk about some ways that you can use phenology. Um, I love this. Uh, this is the poster child of the phenology world is our service berry. And many of you know this, um, the story about service berry and how it got its name. It actually has several names that are phenology related. Uh, but in, in the old days when we didn't have the tools and the, the mechanisms to, uh, to bury those who died in winter, right? So we lost friends or family over the winter. Um, we, we couldn't have the funeral service. We had to wait until the soil had thawed enough that we could dig the grave. And so folks went on you know, cold storage in the barn or in some other place until the ground had thawed enough um, to hold the service. And that the phenological link was when the service berry was in bloom, that was our indicator that oh, the soil has thawed enough, we can dig the grave and hold the funeral service. So a few years ago, I was teaching phenology and there was a woman in the audience from West Virginia. And she said, you know, our little, um, the, our, the little burg that I grew up in, a tiny little holler, we didn't have a, a preacher in our town. The, the preacher came in in spring and they always traveled through around the time that service berry was in bloom, a tradition that, that ties back to um, that, that need to wait until the ground had thawed to, um, to hold the funeral service. Shadbush and uh, Juneberry are two other names of serviceberry that relate to um, shad or the, the fish that are spawning uh, on the East Coast when serviceberry is in bloom. And Juneberry, if you're lucky enough to beat the birds, the, uh, the berries might be ripe in June. And it's kind of like a blueberry. Um, you need to grow service berries if you're not already growing them. So some other ways to, um, how do different groups use phenology? It was the, our calendar was designed to monitor pests of ornamental plants, but there are lots of other ways that this calendar and the, the more general idea of phenology can be used. So if you look at some of the fruit tree management um, publications, you'll see that there are different bud stages that are used to time maybe pesticide application or management strategy on those plants. So they might talk about tight cluster or pink, which is what my, um, my uh, crab apple is in, in pink stage right now. Those buds haven't opened yet. And so different uh, management strategies are linked to those plant uh, uh, phenophases. Here's a, uh, an example of the Hop Growers Guild. So I did a program this winter for the Hop Growers. And you know, hops are a pretty new industry uh, crop in Ohio. And so these folks have come together and they share monitoring ideas. Um, they're learning about pests on hops. They can't go to you know, established growers or, or you know, grandparents to say, how did you grow hops in, in your days? This, these are new, uh, new ventures. And so they shared some, some strategies they were using to monitor plants uh, and relate those, uh, that monitoring to pests that they have. So here, 100% um, emergence, they had related that to growing degree days uh, and uh, were linking that then to, uh, to pests that they were seeing there in the, um, in the hops fields. Beekeepers use this idea for, um, for honey flow. So if you're a beekeeper, you know you want the honey supers on where the honeybees are bringing back the nectar when um, different plants are in bloom. And uh, tulip tree or yellow poplar is a really rich nectar producer. And so it's a target for some beekeepers. They wanna make sure that those honey supers are on before this plant is in bloom so that those bees have a place to bring back um, the nectar to make honey. 
Uh, we also have bees that um, have different seasons. We have seasonality with bees. Somebody mentioned before we started about uh, queen bees, um, seeing queen bees across the state. Those are a very early bee phenological event. Uh, we have other early bees like mason bees and polyester bees, um, and then bees that come later in the season like uh, longhorn uh, bees. And we'll talk about those more in another week. Um, but here's you know, the reason we all need to plant crocus. So very, very early in bloom and uh, the queen uh, bumblebees visiting. I think somebody's unmuted guys, if you could just check that for me, thank you. So ornamental landscape pest management, as I said, this really is the basis of how the calendar was developed. Uh, when forsythia is in bloom, that's when you should be scouting for um, egg hatch on Eastern tent caterpillars. Um, this is the pest that forms that webbing in the crotches of branches in maybe your fruit trees, cherries, and apples. Um, and if you can see those webbings early, e easy to remove if they're small trees with a gloved hand, um, or you can plan some management strategies. Um, but that timing is always going to be the same. When black cherry is in bloom, that's when uh, the Ohio Department of Agriculture actually uses that as their indicator for when to apply BT for gypsy moth. So as you, as you probably know, gypsy moth can be a really devastating pest across the state. They can kill huge mature oak trees and many other species as well. And so when areas are in kind of new stages of infestation, the Ohio Department of Agriculture may use an aerial application of BT, which is an organic pesticide, to kill the caterpillars of gypsy moth um, to keep those, those trees from um, being defoliated and possibly uh, dying. And so they track that bloom time across the counties and, um, and then um, plan out when they're gonna uh, time those, those BT applications. Naturalists use the calendar to link uh, different biological events. So uh, we used to pretty um, reliably say that when red buckeyes are in bloom, Denise, you're muted. Unmute me. Okay, how about now? Are I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so hummingbirds return around the time that red buckeyes come into bloom. And so we used to say you should put your hummingbird feeder out uh, at when those red buckeyes are in bloom. Um, but we do have some mis mismatch now um, about those, um, those two events. We can use phenology when we're talking about creating pollinator habitat. So we want to span the season with bloom for pollinators from our earliest silver maple all the way through to asters. And so we can use the calendar to do that. Um, this is a publication from Cornell that looks at bloom through the season and some different plants that um, can, you know, kind of create that uh, sequence of bloom um, from, from early spring through summer and into early fall. We all want beautiful landscapes that have flowers in all seasons. And so we can use phenology to help us. We can use that calendar to help uh, select plants that are blooming at distinctly different times and uh, plan our gardens that way. Um, I love weeds. And so I did a program last year. Here's me on, uh, this is where I grew up, my gravel road and the colt's foot. Uh, and so I do a lot of, of uh, weed tracking and there's a phenological succession of weeds that can help you with weed identification, what weed is blooming when. And then here's our, our project on iNaturalist, uh, OSU Phenology Fridays, where lots of you have already started. Uh, we have 48 folks, I think it's even more when I looked this morning, who have started to post uh, their observations on iNaturalist in this project. So you can join the project and then post observations. And um, what I'm encouraging you to do in, uh, is put in the notes section, put the growing degree day unit. So we can use that to kind of help us get a, a feel for the growing degree day um, accumulation. So we're gonna take a really quick walk through the season. We've already talked about some of these plants. So this is gonna be um, a, a quick view of what happens from spring through summer. So our red maples, some of our earliest uh, plants to bloom and also our cornelian cherry, dogwood, cornice moss. 
So we do have a mix of native and non-native plants on the calendar. This is a non-native dogwood, um, very loved by honeybees. So if it's warm enough when cornice moss is blooming, you'll definitely see honeybees on this plant. Uh, then we have star magnolia. I talked about that one already. Um, our, one of our first ornamental magnolias to bloom, a nice pollen source uh, for, for some bees. Our forsythia, which I said is the indicator for eastern tent caterpillars. Our next magnolia to bloom is saucer magnolia. Um, often our magnolias get hit if we have a, um, a cold snap, maybe a snowy event or a really cold night in spring. And when we used to do some uh, community science projects across the state with phenology, the question always came up, you know, what does this mean if, I, if my saucer magnolias are killed by frost, it just means that you can't monitor, you can't use that plant to monitor. It doesn't mean that those buds wouldn't have opened um, if they were in the early stages. Um, it just means that, that that event is over, but it doesn't really affect the sequence, right? It just means oh, I can't use my star magnolia. That's the one that usually gets hammered. Um, it's not an indicator anymore. I have to go back to the calendar. Yeah, the smelly calorie pears are in bloom around me, this awful invasive tree, um, just thick in the um, roadsides. And that happens around the time that European pie soft European pine sawfly eggs hatch. So this is the tiny little sawfly larvae that caused this uh, um, prune on our muco pines. They overwinter as these eggs laid in needles. So if we know uh, the, the indicator around the time that calorie pears are in bloom, uh, we can go out, scout our mugo pines, and these little guys are super easy to kill. A sharp stream of water is going to uh, wash them off. They, they can't fly, they can't get back. Um, so really easy way to manage them if we know the timing. Uh, red bud in bloom. Um, I'll bet a lot of you are seeing red buds uh, in bloom right now. That's around the time that gypsy moth eggs hatch. So this is the egg mass of gypsy moth and those tiny little caterpillars. Um, as the caterpillars get uh, in later instars, they're going to be more colorful with these, these hairs but they can do this defoliation on uh, many of our native trees. Next, we have our apples and crab apples in bloom. This is Crablandia at Secret Arboretum. And so that's where um, we always used to say, come there on Mother's Day and see the apples in bloom. But because of some of our climate uh, changes, you're actually gonna be too late if you wait till Mother's Day. So you need to come about 10 days um, earlier or monitor the calendar for Worcester and see when those, uh, when those crab apples are in bloom. Then we're up to common lilacs in bloom and lilacs have a long history of association with phenology. There's actually a national phenology network that uses a red rothamagensis lilac planted across uh, North America and folks turn in observations of data on those lilacs, on bloom times, on um, leaf emergence, um, to really create a picture over time, over decades, of how phenology has, um, how climate has changed based on those phenological events. So common lilac in bloom around the time that pine needle scale eggs hatch. So the scale is a, a little insect with a piercing sucking mouth part, looks like a disease, but this is an individual insect. And underneath this dead scales body, so this is what we see in winter, underneath that dead scales body are eggs. The eggs hatch out in spring around the time that common lilac are in bloom. Um, we call those crawlers and they crawl across the needle and form, um, find places to settle down and then start to form that wax over their bodies. So if we know when the crawlers are active, again, really easy to uh, spray them off with a sharp stream of water, we call that syringing, or use a soft pesticide like a soap or an oil, always reading the label because it can take the wax off your blue um, pines, but an easy way to kill those, uh, those insects without having to use a, um, a high power uh, insecticide. It's the timing that really makes the difference. Another lilac in bloom a little later, the Miss Kim lilac, a really wonderful fragrance. And that can be the indicator for oyster shell scale eggs to hatch. And so we have quite a few scale insects on our calendar, a really nice way to know when those eggs hatch, when those crawlers are active, because again, they're very susceptible to um, soft insecticides. 
So this is actually the scale. It looks like a disease, right? But this is an insect on the stem. Underneath her body are all these eggs. And this is a story that Dan Herms tells. His dad had oyster shell scale in his landscape in um, Kentucky. And dad, Dan was in Michigan at the time and said, dad, put some double-sided tape around that stem and send me the tape every week. And so here's uh, Dan opening up his mail, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then finally on one week, he opens the, the mail and on that tape, there are crawlers. So that's the indicator. Okay, dad, um, now you can start to use your insecticidal soap to kill those crawlers. Black locust in bloom, that's around the time that the adult um, bronze birch borers and also adult emerald ash borers have emerged. So this is my reminder to tell you that the phenology calendar is not a pesticide application calendar, right? So it doesn't tell you when to apply a pesticide. This is a tool that tells you what development stage is happening. And then you actually need to go the next step and say, okay, so I know that bronze birch borer adults are emerging. What do I need to know about bronze birch borers and how to manage them? Because we don't manage the adults. We're not trying to kill the adult emerald ash borers. We're managing um, the larvae. We're preventing um, the, those larvae from damaging the plants. So the, the calendar is not telling you when to apply a pesticide. Um, you need to do the work of investigating that pest and finding out what the management strategies are. Here's an example, some of you mentioned this in um, when I asked what you were hoping to learn in this program, how do I manage bagworms? So bagworms are a native caterpillar pest. Each individual a moth laid, uh, created this bag around itself, that's how they spend the winter. And for each of those female bags, there may be three to 500 eggs inside. They hatch in the spring, they balloon out and they can move to your arborvitae, your pines, your spruce. They really can do a lot of damage to our evergreens. Not so big of a problem on deciduous plants, but they can take all the needles off, um, they eat them and also form these bags with them. But if we know the timing, we either go to the calendar um, or and we have this phenological indicator, Japanese tree lilac, a pretty common street tree. Uh, when this plant is in bloom, that's going to make you remember that bagworm eggs are hatching. So if I want protective pesticide on, um, on my conifer, or if I want a pesticide that's gonna the, kill those little larvae as they start to feed, this is, this is my indicator. I need to time it um, at, uh, with the um, tree lilac. Little leaf linen coming in bloom. So we're getting later in the summer here. This is our indicator for Japanese beetle adults to emerge. Um, and so if we know this, um, this occurrence, this, uh, this link, we can scout for our beetles, early emergers, our scouts themselves, they're out there looking for food in your landscape. If they find it, they're sending signals to call in their um, next emergent brothers and sisters. And so if we know the timing, we know lindens are in bloom, we're gonna see adult beetles, we're gonna start to, to kill those, gather them up in a cup of soapy water. Um, it may reduce the population of Japanese adult, Japanese beetle adults in my landscape. So all the way through to Rose of Sharon, that's kind of when our calendar stops. Let's look at where we are on the calendar. Here we are, Rose of Sharon, first bloom, around 1,347 growing degree day units. So we're sort of at the bottom of that long scroll that I mentioned. Uh, as we get more into uh, midsummer, late summer into the fall, plants are more um, uh, triggered by day length versus heat units. So our calendar is less reliable. Um, day length, um, the shortening of days tends to, to be more reliable as far as, uh, as predicting bloom. So as part, of, um, as part of Dan's work in Ohio, he and I set up this network across the state. And I know many of our phenology network participants are in the audience with our study group. We had 37 identical plots at, at its uh, peak across the state. And those community scientists were monitoring first bloom and full bloom for, um, for a select group of plants to help us predict, is this sequence of events the same uh, from Ashtabula County down to, um, to Hamilton County, over to Marietta, up to uh, Toledo? 
And so our community scientists for years gathered this data and we had a very, uh, a very good predictive model. Yes, that sequence is the same wherever we are in the state. So let's spend um, just a minute or two on how you can gather your own observations and keep data. Um, I keep a little notebook and um, I write down what I see actually on the right side of this page. I've written each of those events from that long scroll. Right, so page by page, notice there are no numbers, as I'm not too focused on the growing degree day units, I want the sequence, I want to know that saucer magnolia is in first bloom and next is PJM rhododendron in full bloom and then weeping hag and cherry and so on and so on, turn the page, turn the page. All I have to do is one time, this is a perpetual notebook, right, I wrote the whole scroll out and then on the left hand side I wrote what I observed happening at the same time. So sugar maple full bloom, I have noted, is around the same time that saucer magnolia is in full bloom. So this is a way that you can kind of extend based on your interest what you're observing around you using the calendar. I suggested this book, and many are already using this book, The Naturalist Notebook, which is a five-year journal as a way to write down what you're seeing and when. And what I would suggest, if you're noticing uh, first bloom of forsythia here on this calendar date, April 25th, that you also write next to it how many growing degree day units occurred on that for that event, um, because that should be consistent from year to year, whereas the calendar date will will vary. I mentioned our um, our uh, project on iNaturalist, and if you join it, then your observations will get loaded onto this project, and you can see some of the cool things that have happened already. We're seeing spring beauties and hepaticas, and Kelly just put some, uh, this bridal wreath spirea, red buckeye, um, this painted turtle. It's really cool to see what folks are seeing across the state. And I would ask then, here's uh, Susan Moore's example, when she posted this carpenter beetle, uh, this carpenter bee on Virginia Bluebell, um, she made a note here that it's growing degree day 182. And that just helps us to compare uh, apples to apples and across the state. So in, instead of the calendar date, it's more reliable. We also have an Instagram hashtag OSU Phenology Fridays. And so you can post pictures of maybe the journal page that you want to load, um, that you want to share, or um, a meme maybe of some of those phenology folklore that you found. This would be a great place to do that. Um, you can also use your photographic record to recreate uh, that phenological sequence because you have the date and the location. You can go back into the calendar, find out how many growing degree days had occurred on that date. So here's an example of a stewardia. It's not on our calendar. I know where I was and when I was. Um, I can go in, uh, put that date in and find out that a, it was about 867 growing degree days. So a way to um, expand the list of, of observations that I'm interested in. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen. I'll let you read this first. So this was Dan's slide from years ago and I always use this for phonology talks because people um, like the idea that um, the trigger for when the, um, the slideshow has ended. And so I'm gonna switch my screen um, if I'm able to do that. And I'm going to uh, try, give me just a second. So we're gonna use, um, all right. That's the one. All right, let me try this. So guys who are helping me, can you tell me, do you see, uh, you probably see my full screen with all my tabs open, but, but do you also see enter a word about something you learned this morning? Yes, I see that. Okay. So this is a, a tool that I wanted to play with. So you guys are all my, um, my guinea pigs this morning, but this is a way for you to give me some feedback. So if, um, if somebody can put this into the chat box, this, um, let's see if I have my chat box too. So we're gonna go to um, this link. Okay. So go to that www.menti.com and your code is gonna be there on the screen. Oops, let me move this, sorry. There we go. Okay, so we're going to www.menti.com. Um, somebody put that in the chat box for us. 
Thank you. And then our code is 77334624. And so you should be able to do, and you can do that from your phone or from your computer. So if you're like, I can't figure out how to get out of Zoom, um, you can do this on your phone. And let's try, what I'm asking you to do is write a word, um, something you learned this morning. So we'll do that for a second. I'll try to get there myself. And if you if you had a question, I don't know if we had any questions in the chat box. We that, did some. Yeah, we can take a question or two. We don't have a lot of time, but we have a couple minutes while folks are working um, to, to find that Menti site. Um, we have someone asked, um, can there be a calendar for ephemerals specifically? And somebody else asked, about mushrooms. They understand it's also moisture, but would this work for mushrooms? Sure. Great question. So um, there are a couple really great historical documents, one out of Dawes, um, and I think one out of the Wilderness Center. And Dan Herms just sent me PDFs of that. So I'll make a point to post that on our study group site. And those are a uh, list of, of uh, wildflower phenology over time, both from Dawes and from the Wilderness Center. They are based on calendar dates, and so uh, so it's you know not as helpful as um, as having that growing degree date. And so if you can take your own, you know, create your own sequence that uses the growing degree day units, that sequence should be the same from year to year. Um, there very likely will be wildflowers that are blooming at the same time, and so it gets um, you know a little complicated to create that scroll. Um, but, but it's definitely doable. Think of what you're interested in and start to take your own notes and make your own observations. You're right about uh, mushrooms. And it's, it's also the reason that we don't have uh, plant diseases in our calendar. Um, and that's because we can't predict the moisture levels, humidity, rain events, um, and that's going to really affect uh, fungi, including pathogens that are, say, causing apple scab. And so we can't say when apple scab is going to occur. It's so dependent on those, you know, leaf wetness and that kind of thing. So an orchard may have a, um, a monitor out in the field that would also monitor uh, things like humidity, leaf wetness, and could predict then specific disease events. But we can't build that into the calendar because of the moisture. So I know that um, Curtis Young is doing a two hour program, I think probably right now, um, actually on uh, woodland fungi identification, and um, he probably has some real, really great insight about that, um, about that phenology, about the association. And people have their folklore, right? You go to look for um, crab apples, yes. uh, or you look for morels when crab apples are in bloom, right? Okay, I'm going to try, um, sorry. I'm going to try and see if I can show us. Oh, maybe I can see I'm new to Menti. Um, and so by the next time, I hope to be able to show us our, our results. Um, but if you could, so on, um, you should be able to go to the same link and the same number, um, put in this, uh, in, in this box, put in um, any questions you have about phenology. So these, these could be questions that um, are kind of hanging out there after today's session or things that you're always wondering, um, because I want to collect those, uh, those questions. Let me see, do I need to do that maybe? Um, so I can help answer those. So we won't have time to get through um, a lot of questions this morning, but I'll come back to these questions and um, be able to answer those. So any other um, questions that we had in the chat box? Look here. Um, somebody asked a question about herbicides and birds um, to feed young with caterpillars. I think I'm going to skip that. Um, we can talk about herbicides and bees when we have our bee session. Um, uh, one person asks if anyone else has had any experience with the uh, U.S. Nature Notebook app um, mm. on the National Phenology Network. 
Okay, good. So every week for the study group, I'm going to feature a different um, community science project. And so Nature's Notebook is definitely, it's that and Project Bud Burst are our big phenology community science projects. And I know lots of folks are involved with one or both of those. Um, and they both have maps. Um, they're, they're looking for folks to come in and monitor different plants. You can monitor lots of plants or just a few. I know Bud Burst is also looking for pollinator observations um, for plants and pollinators and, and their associations. So uh, on the community science area on our website, I'll add some of those, um, those different projects in. Uh, what I'm gonna do, because we have um, about 10 minutes left, and so uh, we're 190 people. So let's do, we're gonna do quick breakout groups. Um, we're going to do 20. Okay, so if everything crashes, guys, it was really great to be with you this morning. Um, let's hope it doesn't. I'm going to create 24 breakout rooms, and there should be seven to eight people per room. And what I would like you to do, we're going to spend just 10 minutes in the room. So we're going to end right on time at 11. Um, but I want you to hop out to your room. I'd like you to, whoever has the first name starting with the letter closest to the A in the alphabet, right? So Bob is going to, Bob is going to be right up there. He's going to lead the group. What I want you to do is everybody give a quick intro, um, include where you're from because you won't know parts of the state. And then I want you to just share a couple observations that you've had this week. What have you been seeing close to you? Okay. And I'll, um, I'll put the timer on. I'll let you know when we come back together. We'll come back together for just a minute or so and, um, and share, and then we'll end. Okay, so I'm going to open all of our rooms. Looks like everybody's popping out to your rooms. All right, so folks are starting to come back into the, the main room. Give everybody a minute. I'm going to close uh, close the rooms. So I'd love your feedback on the breakout groups. Did you like having a few minutes to do that? Let's close all of our rooms. So if you want to put that in the in the chat box, I'd love your feedback on the breakout rooms. Did you enjoy having some time to to chat with each other? Sure, it was good. Good. Nice to be able to see each other too. Mm -hmm. There we go. I lost my people. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Hi, Mary. Ah, oh, my God. <laughs> Look at all those beautiful faces. <laughs> it's so good to see everybody. It is really nice. <laughs> oh, how great. So folks, if you had feedback on the, um, if you have questions about anything we, we talked about phenologically, go ahead and put those in the chat box and I'll get to those another time. Um, and also if you had feedback on the small groups, did you like being able to have a few minutes to kind of visit and um, talk with each other? I'll try yeah. to build that in yeah. every time. So. I did, yes. it was really nice. I like that. Yes. We had, we, we had uh, um, a lot of people on and a lot of breakout rooms, but um, yeah, it seemed like a good no, I think that was it was a good way to get to know people. Okay. I agree. Well, thanks everybody. I want to thank Sarah and Eric and um, Patrick for helping out with the um, facilitating the webinar. Thanks everybody for joining us. And um, if you're watching the recording, um, please email me if you have questions. As I said, I'll post the next uh, week's assignments on Monday. We'll come together next Friday for our lecture with Ashley Kohanek, who did her graduate work in the Department of Entomology on phenology. She's the Medina County educator and she'll be talking about her passion for phenology. So keep uh, taking pictures, right, making your notes, enjoy the beautiful spring weather and uh, we'll see each other soon. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.